Good afternoon, everyone. Sean McDevitt here with Everbridge. Uh, we're going to give everyone about 30 to 45 more seconds to uh, to join. I know that back-to-back -back calls uh, can make things difficult, and this was a uh, pretty, pretty quick turnaround, so I'm sure people had meetings on their calendar. So we're going to give everyone just a few more moments to, uh, to get on. Thank you for your patience. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It looks like folks are, are still trickling in, but uh, I'm sure they'll be able to catch up momentarily. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us today to talk about the collapse of Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, we're going to review and hopefully be able to understand some of the, uh, the current and future impacts uh, that we're going to see in that geographic region as well as around the globe. So uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us again today. Uh, with that said, there are a couple housekeeping items that we want to address before we go ahead and get started. Uh, this is going to be recorded, so if you need access to the recording or want to share it with colleagues after the fact, this will be made available both on YouTube as well as on the Everbridge On Demand uh, section of our, our webinars. We'll also have resources available to you, such as the Situation Report, uh, as well as the, uh, the slides today we can make available. And then if you have any questions after the call today, if you uh, don't have an opportunity to, to ask them in the chat, uh, please feel free to, to email me. My contact information there is on the screen. With that said, we are going to some, uh, you can submit questions directly through the webinar platform. Uh, so feel free to do those. We will try to address as many of those questions as we possibly can uh, at the end of the call today. Uh, we do have quite a bit of material that we do want to cover, uh, but we are going to try to reserve some time for questions. So if you do have questions, please feel free to submit those and we will try to address them. Um, if we are unable to address them today because we run out of time, or perhaps they're too nuanced, uh, I will follow up with you personally. Uh, I will make sure that Josh is included or a member of our Risk Intelligence Monitoring Center is included in that email so that we can make sure that we get the answers that you're seeking. Uh, because we really do appreciate you taking the time to A, join us, and then B, submit some questions today. Um, before we get started, I, I want to introduce myself again. My name is Sean McDevitt. I'm the Director of CEM Product Marketing here at Everbridge. Been with Everbridge for about five years now, kind of sat in multiple roles. Uh, but uh, now I, I am responsible for the product marketing piece for our traditional CEM products, which is what we'll kind of discuss at the end of the call today. And I'm joined by, uh, by Josh, who's our Regional Analyst for North America. Josh, can you give just a brief introduction to yourself as well? Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, so yeah, so my name is Josh Strongen. Um, I am the regional analyst for North America for our Global Insights team. Um, I've been with Everbridge for about eight years and I've been the North America regional analyst for just over five years. Awesome, thanks Josh. And I appreciate you taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, I know that this is kind of outside of your normal duties uh, and it's been a busy 36, 48 hours for you. So I greatly appreciate you taking the time to prepare the materials today uh, as well as present them with me. So thank you so much. Um, you know, with that said, th there are a few opening remarks that we as Team Everbridge want to make uh, before we get into the actual content of the webinar today. Um, so, you know, before we start today, uh, the Everbridge team wants to acknowledge uh, the terrible passing of life that has occurred uh, regarding the bridge collapse in Baltimore. The devastating event has not only claimed precious lives, but also has left a profound impact on the community, families, and individuals across the region. In these moments of profound loss and uncertainty, it's our collective compassion, strength, resilience that bring us together. And today's webinar is not only an opportunity to express our condolences and compassion, but also to learn, to understand, and to contribute towards a future where the safety and well-being of our communities, employees, and organizations are upheld above all. Uh, our discussion today will focus on the immediate responses, um, the ongoing recovery efforts and the imperative of strengthening 
uh, your organization's ability to respond to critical events. So thank you all for, for joining us today for this important conversation and taking the time to, uh, to look at this with us today. So as I, I pull uh, the PowerPoint here, what we're going to, to start with is a timeline of the events. So this is where I'm gonna pass it over to Josh and he's gonna walk us through uh, the timeline of events to get us started. So Josh. Yeah, all right, everyone. So yeah, so I just wanted to go over kind of what happened yesterday um, with the bridge collapse. So again, it began early uh, Tuesday morning um, and involved a ship called the MV Dolly, which is a Singapore flag ship that was departing the port of Baltimore um, and was en route to Sri Lanka. Um, and quickly uh, after the journey began, um, the ship began experiencing unspecified power loss um, and it started drifting in the Patapsco River um, towards the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, so as it began to kind of list towards the bridge, um, the ship pilot um, was able to issue a mayday call um, to local Maryland officials, um, warning of the potential collision. Um, and this gave officials about a minute um, of time to basically try and clear the bridge and stop vehicles um, from entering um, the bridge. And then about a minute after that initial mayday call, um, the dolly struck um, the southern pylon support of the, of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, at the time of the collision, there were eight people on the bridge itself, um, and they were all part of a construction crew that was working on um, road stuff. Um, when that happened. Um, so there were also five vehicles on the bridge that were later found um, after it collapsed. So when the collision occurred, um, it struck the southern support again of the continuous steel truss bridge um, and it immediately broke apart um, the bridge. So once the southern part of that truss bridge collapsed, the way those bridges are constructed, it basically collapsed the rest of the sections of the truss bridge, um, leading to the full collapse uh, that we saw. It took about 30 seconds overall um, for the bridge to collapse. Now the ship itself also suffered damage um, and part of the bridge fell on the ship, um, which included some of the containers falling off the ship. Um, but as of this morning, the ship remained upright um, and there were no reports of pollution in the water uh, and there's no concern of the ship sinking. Um, though officials are monitoring the water levels just as a precaution. So again, like I said, there were eight workers on the bridge at the time when the when it collapsed. Two of them were rescued yesterday and one was treated for injuries. Um, the other six, unfortunately, um, were not found and are now presumed dead. Um, officials continued active search and rescue operations basically all day um, on Tuesday. Um, and those uh, ended last night when the sun went down and then um, continued again this morning um, as more so as recovery efforts and, and the beginnings of investigation into both the collision and what caused the initial power loss uh, of the ship. So um, the collapse caused some pretty significant um, disruptions obviously to the Baltimore area. Um, number one being obviously the closure of the bridge itself, the rest of the bridge that was standing, as well as the surrounding parts um, of I-695. Um, so this included outer loop traffic being diverted at exit 2 to Maryland 10 and inner loop traffic uh, being diverted at exit 43 um, to Maryland 157. Um, and Maryland officials have um, given alternative routes. So in order to cross the harbor, the two best options are the two Baltimore tunnels, um, the Fort McHenry Tunnel, which is I-95, and the Baltimore Harbor Tunnel, which is I-895. Um, however, both of those tunnels have pretty significant restrictions on them, um, both for height and width of vehicles, um, as well as both, um, both tunnels disallow um, vehicles that are carrying hazmat materials. So unfortunately, most tractor trailers and trucks carrying cargo will be forced to use um, the other side of I-695, which wraps around the western um, and northern parts of Baltimore. Now, the Port of Baltimore itself did not suffer any damage during the collapse, but it has stopped all inbound and outbound shipping traffic um, because of the bridge debris um, in the Bar Baltimore Harbor. Um, ground operations at the port itself, which includes the unloading and loading of ships, can continue for the ships that are there. There's about 30 or 40 ships that were already in port at the time. Um, and so that operation can continue, but there are no ships can leave and no ships can enter um, the port. Now, obviously this is really fresh. Um, investigations are just starting into both things and so are kind of the recovery efforts. Um, but unfortunately at this juncture, um, there aren't really any timelines for how long both the bridge and the port are expected to be out of service. 
Um, the port timeline is likely much sooner um, than the bridge uh, timeline. The port will be able to resume normal shipping operations once all of the debris is cleared out of the harbor, which will occur once the investigation is complete and they can start really moving all that out. Um, initial estimates are likely um, anywhere between several weeks to several months. It still remains kind of unclear, um, again, because they are just now starting um, kind of this effort, this investigation and, and the recovery effort. Unfortunately for the bridge itself, that's likely to be a much longer timeline, potentially multiple years. Um, just to put things in perspective, in 2007, um, the I-35 bridge over the Mississippi River in Minneapolis collapsed. Um, it was a, a full collapse like this, but it was a much shorter bridge, uh, and that bridge was rebuilt in about a year. Um, so I would expect this to take at least as long, if not longer than that. Um, and there are a multitude of factors that will obviously go into the rebuilding of, of the bridge there. Um, so those detours and traffic disruptions are likely to be a, a much more long-term thing, whereas the port closure um, is likely to be a little bit more um, of a short-term issue. Now, looking at the uh, kind of assessment of, of what we're looking at and, and the potential disruptions for supply chain and transportation, obviously they're gonna be pretty significant um, more so for the Baltimore area itself than for maybe the U.S. as a whole or, or international shipping. Um, it's not likely that this is going to cause major disruptions to the U.S. supply chain or the international supply chain, kind of like what we saw during uh, um, COVID. Um, the Port of Baltimore is one of the busiest in the U.S. Um, and the disruptions from it being closed for this indefinite period are, are going to be different depending on, on what organizations rely on it for. Um, for instance, the port is, is um, has a limited amount of container traffic. It actually has a much lower amount of container traffic than say the Port of Virginia in Norfolk or the New York and New Jersey ports um, a little bit farther north. And, and both of those ports have already begun to um, be in contact with the Port of Baltimore and are diverting ships um, to those ports. So it's likely not going to cause significant disruptions for container traffic, um, just so more so it's going to change the destination um, of those goods. The biggest thing that the Port of Baltimore um, is known for and, and it's most active for is um, automobile import and export operations. Um, in, in 2023, there were over 750,000 vehicles handled at the port. The, it's the busiest in the US for vehicle import and exports. But again, the, the immediate disruptions from this will probably be significant for those companies that rely on the Port of Baltimore. But in the long term, these are likely to be limited, um, especially for U.S. car makers um, who have operations in the U.S. and then sell those cars in the U.S. Um, this specifically will impact those U.S. automakers who are exporting cars or foreign automakers um, who are importing. Now, the port is also home to a number of other goods. Um, it has several fuel terminals for natural gas and oil, and these things are likely to cause um, some immediate disruptions. These are likely just to be maybe delays in shipments um, and potential um, minor price increases in the short term. But um, overall, there are likely to be alternatives um, for goods, uh, other ports in the US to go to and, and to be able to ship um, goods from. And internally in the US, there are likely to be um, other options a, as well for that. So those, those bigger macro um, disruptions are likely to be more limited. But for the Baltimore area itself, there are likely to be pretty pretty severe disruptions, both immediately and over the long term. Um, the Port of Baltimore is a major economic factor. It brought in over $80 billion um, in trade last year. Um, it uh, employs over 15,000 people directly in the Baltimore area and also supports an additional 140,000 jobs um, throughout much of the area. And a lot of these will be um, temporarily uh, ended um, for the closure of both the port um, and the transportation disruptions as well. So internally in Baltimore, there's likely to be some major traffic disruptions that we see over the next, especially um, over the short term, but, but as this bridge is being rebuilt, um, these are likely to continue. Uh, and for organizations that rely on overland transportation um, through the I-95 corridor across the East Coast, um, these are likely to be um, delayed potentially over the next few months or years um, due to this prolonged route that will have to be taken across the Baltimore area um, with that new detour across the, the longer part of I-695. And locally in Baltimore too, 
um, last mile deliveries are probably going to be delayed, especially in the short term right now as, as we're dealing with the immediate fallout. But because of this long-term bridge closure, um, those are likely to continue um, for the foreseeable future as well. Um, but again, I just, I just want to focus on the fact that there's going to be a pretty significant difference between um, the impacts that we see on, on this micro local Baltimore level um, versus this macro international U.S. level where there are going to be some supply disruptions that we see in, in the immediate uh, next few weeks, uh, but these are likely to be tempered and not cause significant um, disruptions to operations, but it will force organizations to um, rely on contingency plans, uh, maybe make new shipping plans, uh, maybe have alternate shipping uh, routes, whether that's at new ports or via new, uh, whether that's via air or more overland transportation or rail, um, these are going to be the things you see um, in the immediate future. Um, but yeah, so that's the overview, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Yeah, Josh, the, the, there was one question that came in while you were uh, while you were discussing it, and that was, was the dolly required to have a tugboat escort when uh, leaving the secret terminal? So it requires a tugboat when it immediately leaves um, the port, but once it leaves the port, it does not require a tugboat. So like once it was out in the river, it, it does not require one. It does, however, require, and, and this did occur, um, local pilots. So there will be local pilots who go on container and other ships that are entering the port to help pilot them through um, the area. And that was the case um, yesterday. Gotcha, okay, yeah. Um... And just for everyone that is on the call uh, now, I, I've also included the situation report that, that Josh and the team put together. Uh, that has got some great details in it uh, in the chat. You should be able to grab that link uh, and you should be able to download that as a, as a PDF. So I wanted to make sure that that was available for everyone as well. Um, so thank you, Josh, for, for covering some of those components. I'm sure there will probably be more questions that start to come in as we cover other areas of this. Uh, but I greatly appreciate you taking the time to, to go through that and putting it together. So we have already seen some of our customers take action, um, right? And, and some of it is seeing something, saying something, and doing something. Uh, we've really seen that kind of be that the framework that organizations are trying to abide by, right? I, I think they were all familiar with the see something and say something, but the doing something is not always uh, how organizations have oriented themselves in terms of responding to critical events, right? So. The first thing is coordinating communications to employees in the DMV region uh, who were impacted, right? So that was the very first thing that we saw organizations start to do. Uh, one of those things was actually fully automated. We had some organizations that had actually communicated out with impacted employees or security operations centers uh, by about 2 a.m. So we started to see some of those communications go out through a fully automated push. Uh, they also decided to send out communications to individuals who were going to have impacted commutes into uh, or around Baltimore, individuals who be doing field work or travelers who were coming in and out of the DMV region, right? So they had hotel bookings, they had car rental bookings, they had flights in and out of the area and were going to be doing business. So uh, right person, uh, right message, right time is really what we're seeing when it comes to customers taking action in terms of communicating that out. Uh, we saw multimodal communications across multiple different channels go out to those individuals again, Primarily between the hours of about 3.30 a.m. and about 7.30 a.m. was the, the highest uptick in when we saw that. We've also heard some great success stories in terms of information sharing uh, within organizations. So what I mean by that is that uh, one of the first things that we saw was informing what we typically see as a supply chain control tower, communicated with informing them of what's taking place. Not all organizations disseminate risk intel down to uh, supply chain organizations or the control tower. Uh, some automate it, some will say that we want it to go through our GSOC or through our SOC first. Uh, either way is acceptable, right? We need to be able to find a way that makes the most sense. One of the things that I think a lot of people have heard me uh, speak to about before is that, you know, oftentimes there's this idea that we need to break down every silo. I'm not necessarily who someone who believes in that, but I do think that we need to have bridges between those silos so that when an event takes place, we know who to coordinate with, how to coordinate with them, and what the information that's going to be important to them. Um, we've also seen some information sharing starting out with vendors, clients, and suppliers. As Josh mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, obviously we're gonna see a pretty significant impact to supply chain uh, that, you know, particularly in the short term, uh, right, where because either uh, ships are actually blocked in the port right now or blocked access to uh, those particular, uh, C terminals. 
So what we'll see is that in the short term, what we'll be able to, we need to navigate those waters, figure out where we need to get raw materials or how our customers are actually going to be impacted by that terminal closure. And then finally, the last piece that we've heard from, from, our, from our customers, you know, just in the last 24 hours or so, is that they orchestrated response plans to help employees work from home, right? I think that we all, uh, unfortunately, have gotten a little bit better at, at being on our toes when it comes to hybrid work uh, and needing to be able to spin those things up quickly. And so that was one thing that we saw from a, a pure uh, high-tech organization that said, all right, uh, office is gonna be closed. We understand that this would just delay commute into the office. Let's work remotely and then make sure that individuals have the, the tools that they needed. Uh, and then the other piece was resolving those logistical disruptions. So related to information sharing, what are the tasks and action plans that we need to start with as an organization in order to, uh, to mitigate our logistical disruptions in terms of supply chain? So those are kind of the, the main components that we've started to take action with, that we've seen our customers take action with. Uh, I think we'll continue to see more and more of those as those come about. Uh, please feel free to share those with your account manager or with your customer success manager. We're always happy to uh, to make sure that we're educating the group as a whole. Uh, but those are some of the things that came in just uh, as quickly as possible. So I'm going to pivot here for a moment. I do want us to talk a little bit about uh, what's available in the product and what some of the teams have been working on quite quickly to make sure that uh, the best information is available within our CEM tool so that individuals are able to, again, mitigate risk and keep people safe. So I'm going to um, pivot screens here real quick. And let's see if I can get this to work. Sorry, it's spinning at the moment. I might have to stop my, my screen and, and restart. So give me one moment as it thinks about that. We see it doesn't look like it shared the right thing, so let's try that again. My apologies, everyone. I do want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to see the tactical resolution layers, the contextual fields, the risk events that may be important and they will be able to utilize uh, moving forward. So let's just pivot this over here since it didn't want to work that particular way, which is absolutely fine. So some, uh, obviously I'm zoomed in here on Baltimore, uh, particularly near the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, there were some specific risk events that came out, as I mentioned before, and I've dropped into uh, the chat. We've got our, our situation report, which is visible there. Josh and the team did great work to get that information out. We've also got our, our RIMC events that have been included as a part of this as well, so the individuals will be able to see those components uh, and what's in there and what's actually come about. So within those RIMC events, we'll pull those up. We can see there's a variety of those located both in the state of emergency that was issued as well as the specific events that have taken place right on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, beyond that, some other things that have started to come about and the team has worked very hard on is the ability to see some tactical resolution layers directly within the tool. Uh, what we'll see is those are actually gonna be broken out into a couple different categories. The industrial accidents uh, is going to be the first one that we'll take a look at here. So what actually took place, what parts of the roads remain closed, what was the specific event. So this was the very first tactical resolution layer that was released early yesterday morning. Uh, we've also pulled up a, a couple other components. One is going to be transportation for uh, some probably a long tail incident in terms of the traffic incidents. So we do have a traffic incident that's pulling these things up so that as traffic is going to be rerouted around 695, particularly over the bridge, I think we're going to see an increase of these. So as we continue to think about how we respond to this, I think that's going to be important to, to recognize that, hey, we need to keep a closer eye on what disruptions are actually taking place in terms of traffic. And then we've also got a, a layer that's got a, a lot of information here that the team released uh, just a few hours ago regarding what's taken place. And so when I drill into that, we're gonna see different components, right? Port of Baltimore safety zone, this vessel traffic prohibited uh, in this shaded area. So it's about 2000 or two kilometers uh, for that area that's actually been impacted. We can see the different uh, we have Baltimore city, port, uh, port of Baltimore, what those things are, no impact impound traffic. And then we're also gonna see those different areas on what's actually taking place within the city as well. So these are gonna be some very vital pieces of information that I think the team is going to continue to add to over the coming days, weeks, and months probably. 
uh, as we continue to see more information populate uh, in terms of these tactical resolution layers. One last component that I'll, I'll want to make sure that we that we recognize here is within the context layers, if I scroll up, uh, again, as we think about last mile, as we think about delivery, as we think about field service work, as we think about employees getting to and from work, uh, let's keep a reminder that we do have the ability to understand traffic conditions, right? So I, I think that, um, you know, obviously we're going to continue to see increased traffic in different areas based on rerouting, as Josh mentioned, the kind of the local guidance in terms of traffic. But then we also have the ability to look at those traffic cameras. So as we continue to monitor and instruct individuals who are moving in and around the city, we need to be thinking about specifically what those cameras are, what's available to us in those. Now, obviously, these ones along the bridge are, are obviously uh, not in service right now, but a lot of the other ones still are and will provide great context to what's taking place around, uh, around the, the city and around the region. So I do think we've gotten a, a couple other questions here, so I do want to make sure that we have uh, an opportunity to, to answer those. Um, sorry, Josh, I know I said I would try to give you a heads up. These came in as I, was, uh, as I was pulling up the screen there. So what are the galvanizing actions that transportation professionals and citizens can take to demand uh, infrastructure upgrades across all modes? Um, you know, I, Josh, I don't know if that's one that you feel comfortable answering or if uh, we should take that one offline. Um, I think we can probably uh, answer that one offline, yeah. Okay, perfect. And then is there a specific agency that's taking the lead, Josh, in terms of the investigation? Uh, is it the U.S. Coast Guard? Is it NTSB? Is it, who, do we know like what the coordinating agency is going to be uh, as yes. this investigation unfolds? Yeah, so the NTSB is leading the investigation. Um, they announced that yesterday. They basically were kind of hands off yesterday, again, because yesterday was basically all active search and rescue. Um, but starting today, I would imagine they'll take a little bit more uh, authority over the scene um, in investigating. And there's going to be dual investigations. There's going to be one investigation into the bridge itself, um, which it, uh, I do want to note there were no structural deficiencies about the bridge. It was up to code, et cetera. Um, but I also, um, they're going to investigate that, you know, make sure, you know, why did this bridge collapse? Can we do anything more? Um, I know one of the things that has been brought up already is there were not any barriers um, surrounding um, basically the support structures of, of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Those are not required by construction, but many bridges in the U.S., especially major bridges like this, have them to try and limit the potential of uh, situations such as what we saw yesterday. Um, and there will also be an investigation into the ship itself and, and kind of why it suffered this power loss um, that led to um, this whole thing as well. But yes, so the NTSB will be the, the lead um, investigator for this going forward. Awesome, sorry, there's a, a couple more questions. As I start to read through these, Josh, um, uh, are we anticipating updating the situation report? Should individuals kind of keep that link handy? Do you think that there will be updates that, that we make to it? Um, I don't know necessarily that we will update this specific situation report, um, depending on kind of what happens over the next few weeks um, or days even, I guess. Um, if there are major developments, uh, we might issue another situation report, just kind of detailing uh, maybe more specific, you know, especially if it's related to port stuff. You know, if they came out and said, actually, the port's going to be closed for six months, that would obviously be a major uh, disruption. So we might do an, an update kind of on the situation report. And we might also do, instead of a situation report, might end up issuing um, several global flashpoints. Um, so our other regional product um, that will have that will have some of those details in it. So I would imagine we will stay on top of this, but I wouldn't necessarily say that we're going to continually update this specific situation report. So global flashpoints advisories might be the area that individuals should keep an eye on. Yes, we, I, I would definitely say there'll probably be mul multiples of those issued over the coming weeks and months, just to give um, customers an update on what's going on, especially as more things come out. Because again, we're in this situation right now where there's a lot of tentative, we think this is how long it's gonna be, we kind of think these are the disruptions, but at this point, those really haven't all come full into detail yet. No, no, perfect. And jo sorry, Josh, I know we're running out of time. One last quick question. Um, do we have any information on what's been the impact to cruise lines specifically? Have they made any announcements or are they rerouting traffic? Um, you know, yeah. summertime is coming up. I'm sure employees and things like that are, are kind of have that top of mind. 
Um, I don't know that there's been anything officially announced yet. I do think that the disruptions to the cruise line industry in Baltimore is likely to be uh, much more limited compared to some of the other disruptions, mostly due to the fact that peak cruise season is likely going to be coming after the port has reopened and is fully operational again. Now, not to say that there won't be a few cruises in the next few weeks or, or maybe a month or two um, that will have to divert um, to other locations. Um, but I would say overall, it's probably going to be more limited disruptions um, for the cruise industry, assuming that the port um, reopens um, to traffic as is this initial timeline of, of potentially a few weeks or, or at most a few months. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. Um, so uh, I, I know that we're at the, top, at the bottom of the hour, I should say. I want to thank everyone again for taking the time. I know that there was a couple questions we didn't get to. Um, if I did not answer those, if we did not get to them, be sure to look out for an email from us. We'll reach out to you, make sure that those questions do get answered. Again, thank you everyone for taking the time to get together with us today. Uh, we really appreciate you guys setting aside 30 minutes to, to meet. Uh, we know that this was a quick turnaround, but we wanted to try to get as much information uh, into your hands as possible. Um, you know, we're going to continue to update the situation. We're going to continue to update the different contextual layers. And as Josh said, we'll continue to provide different risk events. Uh, that will be pertinent and provide great insights and information. So thank you everyone for your time today uh, and we look forward to uh, to speaking again soon. Thank you.